Why don't we go ahead and get started? Mark's going to get mad at me if he can't do chapter 17 next week. Perseverance of the Saints. I'm trying to persevere through chapter 16. Ted Dean's going to be making fun of me if we don't get done, so I, we got to get going. Party's over, kids. We're starting. Okay. We're in chapter 16. Yes. Who am I? I'm new here. Uh, I'm one of the elders. Well, I know. What's your name? Oh, Matt Heidelball. Okay. I'm also, I, I go by mud sometimes. <laughs> do, by the way, do you have a sheet? If, you, if you're, who has not gotten a sheet yet? We're in week three of chapter 16. We have printouts up front in the foyer. Welcome to those <laughs> who are visiting. And so we've been in the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Uh, uh, let me just borrow your book here. It's this yeah. book right here. It's a systematic theology. So we've, okay, been, we've been in a number of different chapters, and they build on each other. So we're finishing up chapter 16. Next week, Mark will begin chapter 17, Perseverance of the Saints, uh, really Perseverance of God. So we've been in chapter 16 for two weeks. We wanted to slow down just a little bit because this is a really important topic, not that all of them aren't, but sometimes we, Mark and I will slow down or speed up depending on you know, certain chapters that need a little bit more attention. So let me open this one prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for another beautiful morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, oxygen in our lungs, the health to be present. We thank you for your word. Your word is meat and drink. It is life itself. It is the most important thing that we need. It is the revelation of the living God. And we thank you that you have uh, condescended to make yourself known, and that you have uh, given the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem your people, and then he has given us of his spirit that he, we might understand these truths. And so, Lord, we know as we studied very long ago in the first chapters, we can't know you unless you make yourself known, and we can't know you apart from your Holy Spirit, and we can't know you apart from being born again. And we take none of that for granted. Thank you for eyes to see and ears to hear. And I pray for any who are here this morning who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They're deaf, dumb, and blind and don't even know that. And I pray that you would make them aware of their need and then impute to them the righteousness that's only found in Christ, the currency that's required for heaven, Christ's righteousness, that they might know you, love you, serve you, walk with you, and have rivers of living water flow within them. We pray for your blessing upon our last week here in good works, and we ask that you would redeem this hour and then bless Austin Duncan and his message in Genesis 12. May you bring forth rich fruit in the Sunday school and the hour that follows, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, good works, chapter 16. Now, we've covered a lot of ground. I'm not going to belabor the stuff we've gone over before, but I do want to say Again, two things, okay? Number one, there's a real misunderstanding of good works within the church. I'm talking about the evangelical church, okay? And part of that stems from really two primary camps, okay? Two primary camps. We have the Catholic church that thinks as follows. Justification equals faith plus works, okay? Justification equals faith plus works. And we talked about why that's an absolute heresy that's unbiblical and it is not salvific. In other words, if you believe that, you are not being saved by the true God of the Bible because you're adding works to justification, okay? The reform position and the biblical position is as follows. Faith equals justification plus works. In other words, if you are justified by the God of the Bible, you will produce works through the God of the Bible, okay? Ephesians 2.10. And we see it really in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself so that no one can boast. But there is workmanship.
Same with good works. We have people that say, well, you need good works, the Catholics, you need good works and others. People always show their resume when you first talk to them about the gospel, usually, well, I'm not that bad. I, I, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as them or them or them. And so good works enter into their idea of salvation. And so works are necessary to be saved. Okay, that's one false camp way over here. Then you have the other camp that says, no, I've been justified. I have the imputed righteousness of Christ. And, and really, my works are of no consequence. They don't matter at all. Well, that's a complete separation of what I just quoted a minute ago in Ephesians 2.10, and among others. And as we said, as we go through the New Testament and we see what Christ taught, this is a truth that we see over and over and over and over again. Jesus said, you call me Lord, and you say, 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 but you do not do. First John, if you love me, you will obey me. We see this over and over and over again, that good works come after justification. And they are a necessary component to prove, not to save, to prove that you have been justified. And we saw this in James 2. He looked at, he looked at uh, Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22. But Paul made it very clear in Romans 4 and 5 that what Abraham did in Romans 5, I'm sorry, Genesis 15, 6, that was when he was justified. He believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And what he did on Mount Moriah with Isaac Chapter 22 in Genesis, obviously seven chapters later, proved that he was the genuine article in Genesis 15, okay? So that's a quick overview of one of the things that we've been talking about. So let's jump into paragraph five. Paragraph five in chapter 16, and we'll look through these verses. We cannot by our best works merit pardon of sin or eternal life. Notice the word merit, okay? Merit pardon of sin or eternal life at the hand of God by reason of the great disproportion that is between them and the glory to come and the infinite distance that is between us and God, whom by them we can neither profit nor satisfy for the debt of our former sins. Our debt is incalculable. If I asked you to walk to the moon, that is an impossibility, okay? So it is too with salvation in ourselves. We will never be as perfect as God, and our sins condemn us. So the, the, the distance is far too great. But when we have done all we can, we have done but our duty, and our unprofitable servants, because they are good, because they are good, I'm sorry, when we have done but our duty, and our unprofitable servants, and because they are good, they proceed from his spirit. And as such, they are wrought by us. They are defiled and mixed with so much weakness and imperfection that they cannot endure the severity of God's punishment. In other words, we looked at this last week at the very end. Even when we do what we're supposed to do, we're still unprofitable servants on his estate, right? A cop never pulls you over and thanks you for going the speed limit, okay? And so anything that we do is by his spirit. Dr. Lawson said this about three weeks ago. Anything that we do that's good comes from God. And anything that we do that's bad comes from us, okay? And so even our best works can't endure the severity of God's punishment outside of Jesus Christ. So we are doing good works because we're in Christ by his spirit. Twice, God the Father said, this is my beloved son. In him, I am well pleased. He's not well pleased with anybody else. So we must be in Christ to be pleasing to the Father, and then through his spirit, he gives us the ability to do good works. Let's look at Romans 3.20. Talked about a second ago, this foreign righteousness that we need to have. Romans 3.20. Now he's just got done talking about Jews are sinners, Gentiles are sinners, the whole world's under condemnation. And then he starts to bring the solution here. Chapter 3, verse 20, Romans. Because by works, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. One of the reasons we had the law was to show us our sin. 
And as Calvin said, our works condemn us. How therefore can they save us? The answer, of course, is they can't. But look at verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested or revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all of those who believe, for there is no distinction. And we know in chapter 10, he goes on to say that Christ is the end of the law for those who believe. doesn't mean the law was completely abrogated. It just means that Christ fulfilled the law in your place. He did what you can't. And so his perfection now accrues to your account. I just quoted this, but let's look at Ephesians 2, verse 8, 9, and we'll look at 10. Ephesians 2, we we can't go to this enough, okay? I know we've seen this in our study who knows how many times. But this is is three verses that you ought to commit to memory. Three verses that you ought to commit to memory, among others. But Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, I want you to notice, if you have a highlighter or a pen, notice in that one verse he says, by grace not of yourselves, gift of God. Hey, when you're studying your Bible, use your pen or highlighter, and you can see these things jump off the page. Circle words that Paul uses or the writer uses, words that repeat, words that have the same category. He's trying to show us it's by grace. It's not of yourselves, and it's a gift, okay? He's he's jumping up and down here as he writes this. Look at verse 9. It's not not as a result of works. Now, why would he say that? Because that's man's DNA. You boot up a human being, they want to tell you how good they are. They want to talk about themselves and what they do. This is the very DNA of our sinful nature. It's all about us. It's not as a result of works that no one should boast. There he is again, same category, same theme, verse 10. For we are whose workmanship? His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which who? God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, don't get it out of order. Paul writes 8 and 9 first, then he writes verse 10. We looked at a Philipp- we won't look at this this morning, but we looked at Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Okay, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, verse 12. But then he writes, verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Don't get it out of order, okay? Satan, by the way, loves to get things out of order and confuse people and damn them, okay? Romans 4, Romans 4. Romans 4, 5, and 6. Paul's talking here in this section of Romans about justification. Romans 4, 5, and 6. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Same concept that we saw in Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was what? Reckoned to him or imputed to him as righteousness righteousness. He just got done talking about Abraham didn't find anything according to the flesh. What does circumcision do from a fleshly perspective? Nothing. It's a sign outwardly of an inward reality. Next week, we're going to have baptisms. Do baptisms save? No. There are some in the church who say baptism is required for salvation. That's not biblical. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality. It's, in a sense, Old Testament circumcision. Same thing. You're identifying yourself with Christ. You're doing it in obedience to his command. And you are, you are telling others as a testimony that I have been born again by Christ. But the water itself isn't have, doesn't have any saving value, just like the Lord's Supper doesn't. It is, a, it is an ordinance that the Lord gave us as a remembrance, as a testimony of being in Christ. And so what did Abraham find? Nothing. But he says, the one who does not work, but believes. Remember the order here. You're not working to believe. You believe, then you do good works because you have the spirit of God in you and you are imputed with the righteousness of Christ. Verse six, just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man whom God reckons righteousness. Notice this, highlight it, 
underline it, apart from works. We've got to get the order right, okay? Remember, we talked about the ordo salutis, and there's a reason why perseverance of the saints is next week. And then I think it's assurance of salvation is the following week. These all build on each other. Look at Galatians chapter 5. And while we're turning there, think about this. It's, you think about the, I thought about this yesterday as I was putting this together. You think about Paul, okay? You had Saul the Pharisee, educated, Gamaliel, just scrupulous. I mean, this guy would have had a degree from Harvard and Yale, okay? And then he would have gotten a master's degree from Harvard Business School. Very well educated. And what does he say in Philippians 3? When he was a Pharisee named Saul, it was scubalon. It didn't, it, not only did it not benefit him, it was damning him. But when he sees God through the Lord Jesus Christ on the, on, uh, on the way to, on the way to um, Damascus, and he gets knocked off his horse, he becomes Paul, the Pharisee, or Paul, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And now all of that scubalon is a benefit, right? Because he can teach Jews, he can teach Gentiles. He knew it backward and forward. So there's an order there. Before, your works condemn you. After you're born again, your works can glorify God. Do you see that? There's an order to this. Genesis, or, I'm sorry, Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. We looked at this briefly last time. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Again, this ought to be the DNA of your life. Not in perfection, but in direction. This ought to be what you are identified with, okay? Your life ought to be showing in greater measure love and joy and peace and patience. And that doesn't mean that when you're on 75 and somebody cuts you off, you don't get impatient, okay? Maybe you guys don't. I do occasionally, okay? But this ought to be your DNA as Christ conforms you to his image. Let's look at Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah 64, 6. Isaiah 64, 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Sounds like Romans 3, right? There is no one who does good, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. They have all turned aside. Their poison of asp is on their lips, so forth and so on. Same thing. We've become unclean. Our righteous deeds are filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. In other words, no one can stand before God in themselves. Remember, the three great imputations we talked about. The world, everyone that is born comes into the first imputation. Adam's sin imputed to, the right, to, to all of mankind, right? Adam, through his seed, all of mankind has been infected with sin, Okay, that's the first imputation. The second two are for the believer. Christ's righteousness imputed to the sinner and the sinner imputing his sin to Christ. So when God looks at Christ, he sees our sin. When he looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Those are the three great imputations. And what he's saying here in Isaiah is all of us are unclean. We're all in Adam and we need the second Adam to have the imputation of his righteousness put to our account through justification. Look at paragraph six. Paragraph six, as we keep going. Paragraph six. Yet notwithstanding the persons of believers being accepted through Christ, their good works also are accepted in him. Not as though they were in this life wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight, but that he... Looking upon them in his son. Remember, that's the imputation I just talked about. The one that sees, God sees us in Christ and his righteousness. He is pleased to accept and reward that which is sincere, 
although accompanied with many weaknesses and imperfections, okay? Even our best deeds in Christ are stained with sin. I'll give you an example. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, probably the greatest preacher ever, than maybe other than Paul and Christ and, and obviously the apostles, okay? Considered one of the greatest preachers of all time. Gave a sermon, okay? Somebody came up to him afterwards and said, Mr. Spurgeon, I so loved that sermon. And he said, thank you, but the devil's already told me the same thing. <laughs> and so, in other words, we are so filled with ourselves that even our best deeds, giving away money, doing Sunday school lesson, whatever it might be, it's, we still have that insidious infection of sin that we'll never get rid of this side of heaven, okay? So that's the point they're making here. God accepts them even though they're, it's like your kid coming home at third grade and giving you a little gargoyle or something that just, you know, the head's off and it's just, I still have one, by the way. I have a couple of them on my desk. These little, I guess they're, they're, they're owls, but they're on my, and they're prized possessions. But at three, I mean, they just look, you know. But it's kind of what our works are, I'm sure, to the Father. I mean, they're, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're not pretty. But God can make them beautiful because he can do so much with so little. And so that's the idea here. We're not doing this to merit his favor, we already have his favor. You'll never be more holy. You'll never be more loved. You'll never be more righteous because you have all of that imputed to you in Christ. We do it out of gratitude, right? You serve your husband and wife, those of you who are married, because you love them out of gratitude and thankfulness for who they are, not because they tell you, not because they make you, okay? So the same is true here with, with us and Christ and his works, Ephesians 1.5. Ephesians 1.5. Verse 4. Notice he says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now that's the goal, is to make us and conform us into the image of Christ. Same thing as Romans 8.29. In love... He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. He, he could have done so much less, but he not only redeems us, he adopts us into his family. Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. We are adopted into God's family. Think about that. And so, of course, he's going to love us the way he loves Christ. And he's going to accept our works, though, as they say here in this paragraph, they're accompanied with many weaknesses and imperfections. You know, there's so many people in the church that don't serve because they're, well, I'm inadequate. I'll never preach like Do Dr. Lawson. I'll never know, you know, I'll never be able to do, I, you know. I mean, that's just hogwash. You have been given a gift, at least one gift, and God has created you special for his church for his body to be used so there's no excuses of well i'm not this i'm not that no you can be used of god greatly god can use one man a hundred percent sold out than more than he can use a hundred men ten percent sold out and so don't fall into that trap that somehow your weakness and imperfection can't be used by god you think you think peter's weakness and imperfection were used yeah, as has been said, Stephen got 3,000 stones. Peter got 3,000 souls when he preached. So we don't know. Hopefully we, hopefully we get, you know, souls, not stones, but we don't know what the Lord's ministry is for us. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. This is getting on a little bit of Mark's lawn here next week, but verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. It is permanent. It is fixed. And verse 5, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. 
Isn't that, isn't that comforting? Your salvation is protected by the power of God. It sort of reminds me of uh, John chapter 10 where he says, I, I won't lose one. It's like almost double security. Christ has the sheep in his hand and then the father has Christ and those sheep. And so we are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You didn't get yourself into this and you can't get yourself out of this, right? All right, look at Matthew uh, 25. Matthew 20, I'll tell you what, let's look at Hebrews 6.10 while we're in the neighborhood here so you don't have to flip. Hebrews 6.10, go, go back to your left a little bit. Hebrews chapter six. Remember we talked about chapter six a number of times. Verse nine is the hinge upon which this chapter is understood. He talks about false converts in the first eight verses. And then nine, he says, but beloved, switching subjects, but beloved, talking about believers, that should send bells and whistles off in your head. Verse 10, for God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. This is a great comfort, this verse, because... Serving the church, serving the body, those of you who are engaged in that, it can become wearisome. It can become what looks to be fruitless, and it can bring us down. And his encouragement here is, hey, God's not unjust to forget your work. It's like when I was teaching our kids growing up, you know, catechizing them, going through Bible verses when they were little. Can't tell you how many times I said to my wife, it's like hosing concrete. That was my phrase. It's like hosing concrete. I'm just splattering it with water and it ain't going in at all. I mean, because sometimes it's just, you know, as a dad, you're just going, they're, they're, not, they're not paying attention. They're goofy. Sometimes I had to truncate it and say, go to bed. You guys aren't even teachable tonight because they were so silly. Okay. But the point is, it was of benefit. It does go in. God does produce fruit and seed when he's ready. In fact, it reminds me of, um, I think it's Galatians 6.10. Galatians 6.10, where he says, um, uh, verse 9, and let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. In other words, keep throwing the seed. Just keep throwing the seed. Don't worry about it. Keep throwing the seed. Keep doing what you're doing. If you're doing the sound, keep doing the sound. Be the, as excellent as you can. If you're teaching Sunday school, keep doing it. Just keep going. God will use it. God will redeem it, even though you can't see it. Okay? That's the point. Matthew 25. Look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25. I mean, those of you, I'm sure they're in this room like me, I've been praying for my family, praying and praying and praying and praying. 25 years now. And I haven't seen an ounce of fruit in some of those prayers. Not an ounce. And you know what? I may end up pushing up daisies before God does anything. But that doesn't mean we stop. We're like the woman. Just keep going. Come to the door. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Keep doing. That's what we're to be about. Matthew 25. I'm talking to myself. Matthew 25, 21 through 23. Matthew 25. Now, uh, 21 through 23. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Verse 23, same thing. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. First of all, and this, isn't, this is a little bit of a different sermon, but if you haven't been put over many things, it's probably because you're not being faithful in few things. People say, well, I'll, I'd give if I had a million dollars. No, you wouldn't. Because if you can't give with a thousand dollars, you're not going to give with a million dollars. And guess what? God's probably not going to give you a million dollars because you don't, you don't, you're not doing what you should with a thousand. And the same holds true with our talents, okay? If you haven't been put over much, it's because you haven't been faithful in little. That's one of the concepts here. But the, the, the point here is God gives us talents to use. And as we use them, he multiplies them. What does he do with the one who had one talent and buried it? He says, you wicked slave. And he casts him out into darkness. That's a picture of the, of the non-believer. 
Think about the gifts and talents. It never ceases to amaze me that there's the, the unbelievers sometimes, just the amazing amount of talent they have. I don't know, if, I, don't, I don't care if it's throwing a football or if it's painting or if it's music and they have no concept where they got that. They have no ability to understand that God gave them this as a gift. A man can receive nothing, the scriptures say, unless it's been given to him from above. So everything that you have, talents, treasures, gifts, health, it all comes from him. And so we have been given talents and we're to use those. And God doesn't judge us on the talents we don't have. He judges us on the talents we have and how we use them. Does that make sense? God doesn't judge us on the talents we don't have. He's not expecting all of us to be John MacArthur, but he judges us on what he did give us and what we did with it. That's the point of the, par- of the talents here. That's one of the points of the talents. Okay, let's look at paragraph seven. Paragraph seven. And by the way, well, never mind. We don't need to go over that. Paragraph seven. Works done by unregenerate men, in other words, unbelievers, although for the matter of them, they may be things which God commands. In other words, they're unconverted and they do things that God commands us to do, right? Whether it's loving our neighbor or something, but they're doing it in the flesh. They're not doing it in Christ. So even though they do things that God commands and of good use both to them and others, Yet because they proceed not from a heart purified by faith, nor are done in a right manner according to the word, nor to the right end, the glory of God. Notice that, okay? It doesn't mean that unbelievers don't do good things. Of course they do. There's tons of philanthropists and people that have done one. I mean, I got to be honest with you. Does anybody in this room know a believer who you're pretty pretty convinced they're a believer who maybe doesn't act as well in your office as an unbeliever? Yeah, I've known a lot of unbelievers. I know they're unbelievers and they're they are just wonderful people, right? Doesn't merit them heaven, but they're wonderful people. And so the point they're making here is, hey, unregenerate men can do things which God commands, but notice that it's not out of a heart purified by faith. It's not done according to the word of God. And it's not done for the ultimate end, which is the glory of God. What's the chief end of man? Very first catechism question that kids learn. What's the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And it says, they are therefore sinful and cannot please God, nor make man meet to receive the grace from God. And yet their neglect for them is more sinful and displeasing to God. In other words, what they do doesn't merit them anything. But neglecting to do those makes it even worse. So it has to be done out of a regenerate heart. It has to be done for God's glory. It has to be done according to the Bible. Again, go back to Uzzah and the ark. He had the best of intentions to try to keep the ark from hitting the ground. Your best intentions don't mean anything to God if it's not according to his word. They should have had the Kohathites carrying that thing. They should have had the pre, the, 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 the Levitical Kohathites should have been carrying it. They were doing everything according to the Philistines. That was their, the, their, their best intentions. And God struck him dead for it. And so your best intentions mean nothing if they don't plumb with the word of God. And so unregenerate men can do these things, but because they're not in Christ, because they're not biblical and they're not doing it to glorify God, they're doing it to glorify self, which is what men do outside of Christ. They're sinful and they can't please God. But not doing them is even worse. So remember, you're judged, God judges men. There's, there's levels of judgment, okay? He doesn't judge men all the same. We see that in the scriptures. Look at 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings chapter 10. Second Kings chapter 10. That's why Jesus can say, Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented, you know, before you. Second 
talking to the Israelites, obviously, in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians, 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 30. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well executing what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall, shall sit on the thrones of Israel, okay? God had pronounced judgment on the house of Ahab. And so Jehu had, comp had really been the instrument that God had used one among others, had been the instrument of judgment upon Ahab. Look at 2 Kings, I'm sorry, look at 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings 21. First Kings 21. And it came about when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted, and he lay in sackcloth and went about despondently. Then the word of the Lord came to Eliah the Tishbite, saying, Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but I will bring it upon his house in his son's days. Okay? And so the point here, and you go one chapter later, God kills Ahab for his wickedness. So this repentance here is not because he's all of a sudden converted and he's now a believer in Yahweh. He's, he's, doing, the, he's doing his works in the flesh in a sense, but God's still going to judge him for it because he kills him in the very next chapter. He shows himself to be wicked. He does it all through his life. He marries the most wicked woman, one of the most wicked in the Bible in the Old Testament, Jezebel. And so this didn't merit him, you know, God sparing him and saying, hey, now you're one of mine. And so this is a picture of what they're talking about here. It's just like the men who get on the rug and they pray toward Mecca five times a day. That, that, that doesn't impress God. God says the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to me. It has to be done in Christ, the apple of his eye. Remember, this is my beloved son in him. I am well pleased. It has to be in the person of his son. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 5. We looked at this a few weeks ago as I think Steve was teaching. I can't remember who taught this. But in Genesis chapter 4, verse 5, talking about Cain and Abel. Abel, on his part, verse 4, brought the firstlings of the flock and their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. It was a blood sacrifice. The, gen the author to the Hebrews in Hebrews 11 makes this clear that Abel's sacrifice was pleasing. But look at verse 5. But, transition, for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Cain brought the fruit of his hands. He brought his own best thinking. He was going to do it his way, and God didn't have regard for that. So here we have another man doing things in the flesh that he thinks merit favor with God, and God says, I don't have regard for that. I'm not going to do it that way. I don't care how many candles you light. I don't care how many masses you attend. I don't care how many robes you wear. I don't care how many things you think make sense. I'm the one who rules the universe. I'm the one who created everything. And I'm the one who dictates how I'm worshiped. And I'm worshiped through a blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That's why Christ had to shed blood. He had to climb on a tree because cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He had to fulfill the law perfectly in your place because we couldn't. And so he took upon himself flesh, as the author of the Hebrews said, that he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And he fulfilled the law perfectly in our place. And so God is the one who dictates how he's worshipped and how he's approached. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Flip back to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. First Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13:1. And if I speak with the tongues of men and angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And so even our best works can be tainted if they're not done in love. 
okay? Matthew 6, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. When therefore you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. In other words, they're sounding trumpets and they're making a big show. He's saying, guess what their reward is? Their reward is the praise of men. They have their reward. That's their reward, the praise of men. Verse 5, and when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Remember, Paul says later, we do things sometimes as eye service or with, for eye service as men pleasers. Same concept here. Jesus is saying they want to be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. In other words, they get their name in the paper. They get their name on a stadium. That's their reward. That's it. That's what they get. And then when some bigger donor, and, I, and again, I, don't, I, I, I need to be careful here. There's nothing wrong with giving money and having your name put on a stadium per se, okay? Of giving to a university. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But when there's another donor who gives more, their name's going to go on the stadium, right? So that's their, that, that's their reward. Verse 6, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, and when you have shut your door, Pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will repay you. Some say will repay you openly. So God, having seen what is done in secret, will reward you openly, okay? He will be the one. Let another man praise you and not yourself. Paul just quoted that proverb a couple weeks ago. Let another man praise you and not yourself. Amos 5. Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5, 21 through 23. I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, and I will not even look at your peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, and I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. There are so many that seem to get, uh, that, that, are, that are impressed by the outward religion of man. They're so impressed by the outward religion of man, whatever that may be, right? I, I hear this, I've heard this throughout my life where, wow, I'm so impressed by, you know, we went to the grotto or we, we did this or we did that. God's not impressed by that if it's not according to his word, if he's not approached the way he has said he should be approached. None of that matters. And that's what God is trying to show us. And that's what he says here to Amos. I, get, I get out of here with all of your festivals and your solemn assemblies. I don't care because you're not approaching me the way I have said to be approached. And we see this all the time in Christendom. Who says that you have to come through Jesus Christ? You're telling me that that's the only way to heaven. Yes, that's what God is telling you. That's the only way to heaven, through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that just kills people. They hate that when they first hear it, most of them. But that's what God says. I will be approached through Jesus Christ, or you will not approach me. And if you do approach me, you will be destroyed because you're coming in your flesh you must have an intermediary who can come and bring the two of us together. God and man, perfect God and perfect man together in one who can bring the two and reconcile you. you. And so this is what God thinks of false religion right here in Amos. Look at Romans 9, Romans 9, verse 16. Romans 9, verse 16. It 
So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And he says in verse 15, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. It doesn't depend on how much man does. It doesn't depend on how much man wills. It doesn't depend on how zealous he is. Zeal without knowledge, right? My people are being destroyed because they have zeal without knowledge, God says. None of that matters. It's God's mercy. It's the publican on his face. God be merciful to me a sinner. Whereas the Pharisee was saying, man, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. It doesn't matter what man thinks or wills or runs. It's all about God's mercy. That's the beginning right there. That's the beginning. Look at Titus 3, 5. Another clarion call of Paul about how salvation works. Titus 3, 5. Titus 3, 5. Underline the first three words. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, because guess what? We didn't do any, right? Rhetorical, rhetorical point, we didn't do any, but according to his, there's that word again, mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. He saved us because of his mercy and he regenerated us by his spirit. Look at Job 21. Job 21. Job 21. Job 21, verse 14. And they say to God, depart from us, we do not even desire the knowledge of thy ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what would we gain if we entreat him? Okay? There, that, that's the, the mind of the unbeliever. I have, I have no interest in dealing with God. Why would I entreat him? Who is he? Look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25. We looked at this before. In the very first week of good works, we spent quite a bit of time in this. So I'm not going to belabor it, but look at Matthew 25, talking about the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25, I was on 24, no wonder I couldn't find it. Uh, then he will say in verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, the, the goats, the unbelievers, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And so... Their response is, well, when did these things happen? I mean, when did we not see these things? Lord, when did we, verse 44, when did we, did we see you hungry and thirsty or stranger, naked or sick or in prison or not take care of you? In other words, they missed it. They missed it. They were so self-absorbed, they didn't see anybody else's needs. And then they're incredulous when Lord says, you missed it. You didn't do these things. You see that? Earlier, when he talks about the sheep, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. They did all those things and they didn't even remember. It was so natural because of what God had done in them supernaturally that they didn't even remember. When did I, when did I feed or clothe or... I mean, I don't remember that, Lord. And he says, when you did it to the least... You did it to me. It's all the difference in the world. You see that? All the difference in the world. And the difference between how the sheep and the goats do things in this passage. And I think it's extremely instructive what we're talking about here with good works. We are, we are simply walking with the Lord. And we are doing 
what his spirit leads us to do. We're not keeping account. We're not, we're not remembering most of what we do. We're just doing it because we're doing it out of gratitude for what God has already done. Remember, good works are the fruit. Justification is the root, okay? All right, next week, Mark will take off in chapter 17, Perseverance of the Saints. Let me close. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we had in this chapter. I pray that you would mark these truths upon our hearts. Help us to understand them in greater measure. Bless Austin Duncan as he teaches now in Genesis 12. We're thankful for his ministry, for his family, for his gifts and talents. Pray that you would uh, bless richly the word of God as it goes forth. And we pray next week for the baptisms and for the ministry of your word, that you would bring forth rich fruit, that you would be glorified in this ordinance. Thank you that you continue to build your church. And these folks are a testimony that even today you are changing lives and redeeming your people and building your kingdom. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Mm -hmm.